right. So it's 4.30 and uh, we actually, it looks like the members of the committee, both committees uh, for the most part are here. Uh, so we can go ahead and get started that way. We'd we'll be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, so thank you for joining us. I'm Jesse Letterman, Chairman of the Maintenance and Development Committee and the Committee on Sustainability and Environment. Uh, this is a joint meeting of those two committees. I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Councillor Govan, who is a member of the Sustainability and Environment Committee. We're also joined by Councillor Curran and Councillor Perez, who are members of the Maintenance and Development Committee. And I see that Councillor Hurst is also on the call. Uh, and then our guests for the meeting are uh, Director Sullivan, as well as uh, Melanie Jacoby, uh, who are going to be covering our two topics with us. So we have two agenda items this evening. The first is just an overview um, from the Parks Department at that we had had an overview from DPW and some other departments that fall under the committee at the beginning of the year. Uh, but uh, Director Sullivan was not available at that time. So we wanted to make sure that he had a chance to update uh, the new members of the committee. Uh, as well as myself as the new chairman relative to his priorities for 2022 and how we can be uh, supportive of those priorities and share some of ours with him. Uh, and then the second agenda item is a discussion on uh, the uh, future plans for rooftop solar, uh, both on our two new schools that are being constructed, uh, as well as any other possible municipal buildings that might be eligible. So we'll, we'll get to that uh, secondly. Um, I also want to recognize that I see Betsy Johnson, a member of the public and uh, Walk Bike Springfield, as well as the Armory Quadrangle Civic Association is with us. So Betsy, thanks for being here. Uh, so I think we can go ahead and get started uh, with Director Sullivan. Uh, Pat, if you want to go ahead and just uh, take it away on the first agenda item relative to uh, your goals and priorities for 2022 in your department. And Pat, I don't know if you're if you're talking or not, but you're muted if you are talking. Sorry about that, Mike. I'm, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulties here. Um, the city council has been a tremendous support of everything as we move forward over the past 15 years, and I'm sure that will continue this year. Uh, for 2022, we are in the process of preparing our MSBA statement of interest, which is always a big priority. So we're going to actually, I think we have a subcommittee meeting on those submissions with you and uh, hopefully Council of Whitfield's committee next week. Um, and then we go, I think, before the council on March 7th to be um, fully voted upon. And those are always very critical. And we always end up with three or four projects from the MSBA. So they're critical to either roof projects, window projects, or HVAC um, projects for improvements to our schools. We also are very busy planning our grant um, season for this upcoming year. Uh, the state has announced it's continued with the PARC. The federal government is still continuing with the land and water grant program. So as we develop those um, projects that fit, we're still waiting to see what their criteria will be, but we will always have a project to fit what they will fund. So we will be coming before the um, council as we get more information on that for passage of, of those grants. The Park and Building Department, we have sufficient funds to uh, maintain our facilities and our parks, and they were tremendously used during the, the COVID. And it was kind of heartwarming of all the responses we got from the public of appreciative of having the park land and so forth. So the, the other big thing is the CPA um, process has worked very good, and we've had some delays due to COVID with those construction projects. But I think a lot of people will see the the fruits of the labor over the last two years with those because a lot of them will start coming online uh, this spring and early summer. And that's been a tremendous asset to the department to be able to make those smaller type of improvements with the uh, tax dollars that are available through that additional tax. Uh, but that support from through the neighborhood councils, people come forward every year with projects and our, we, our deadline will be March 3rd uh, for, for those um, projects for this year. And um, so we have a list of about 12 CP projects that we're gonna um, submit on behalf of uh, the neighborhood councilors or individual residents. We just met with uh, the folks at Venture Pond and the 16A neighbors uh, neighborhood there. They've actually decided to wait for their phase two for the following year. So it's kind of neat that it's brought, I think a better process for people to 
communicate with us um, as far as what they would like to see in their uh, neighborhood parks and for improvements. So overall, um, I think we're getting the support at all levels and uh, we appreciate that support and uh, we're excited about the continuation of doing our best to uh, maintain our park system and, and our public buildings. That's great, thank you, Pat. And we'll definitely dive more into the um, MSBA projects at that meeting next week. So we won't we won't go too far into that uh, today since we know that's coming up. But um, just a couple of a couple of projects that that I've been familiar with that if you could provide a quick update on, and then I'm sure um, other counselors may have similar projects that they're interested in. Um, uh, the Westminster Street Children's Park, how are we doing there? I, I know it's almost completely done, uh, but yeah. what, are, what are the finishing touches they're waiting on? I think uh, we're just uh, waiting for that water hookup with water and sewer for the irrigation system, and that mm -hmm. should be the spring. And um, I, I hope we're doing a ribbon cutting there, hopefully by May. And then there was just one more accessory piece for the uh, playground. I think it was like a, a musical element. And I, I think that might, might to come in in the last month so that definitely as well but we had a great contractor he actually ended up donating the services to put the walkway in and uh, we worked with this lady by the name of mrs letterman who was very passionate passionate with the project so she's been uh, a great support and great to work with as the rest of the mcknight neighborhood council um so it's been a fun project and it's been a neat project in that, again, it was grassroots from the neighborhood. And I think that's when you have the most success when you've got the neighborhood involved like that. So they're that's next. Yeah, they're I know the neighborhood is really appreciated it. And McKnight's gonna be under study. We've got that CPA funding finally. So that'll, that's gonna be neat to finally study that and work with the neighborhood for a better design for, um, for um, uh, magazine park. Sorry. Yes, that was going to be my. I was going to be my, one of my next questions. Was I know we had approved some CPA funding, and I wanted to know where that was. But real quick on Westminster Street, uh, I know there were plans to put a uh, one of the uh, mini libraries there. Do you have that library, or does um, Irene have it? Yeah. I think John Billadu has it in the shop, but I can follow up on that tomorrow. Okay, okay. I have the books for it. Oh, great. Uh, so whenever it's ready to be installed, I mean, probably not until it gets a little warmer, but whenever that's ready to be installed. Yeah, once the, you know, we'll probably put it in in April, so. Okay, great. Yep. All right, and you were saying Magazine Park? That was one of my questions was Magazine. Yeah, so we got a CPA to conduct a study and basically that'll be a uh, conceptual master plan for the park. And so there'll be probably three to four public meetings where we got public input. And, um, and that's always a fun process because it, it brings forward a lot of ideas and, um, and it will be probably have to be a phased approach for the improvements. Uh, we've kind of started the process with the neighborhood council. The so, CPA um, funds CPA that were felt it was, did that, that included some funds for actual physical changes too, though, right? It, it did. Um, so that but I, I don't have, until we do the study, we won't know what makes sense depending on right, how- But it is fun. Batman. My, my gut, it'll probably go for like a, towards the playground unit that the additional funds of the sample okay. to maybe restore the ball. Okay. So we'll all, we'll all make together of what makes the most sense. That's great. Uh, and then my final question before we open it up, I'm sure other council have questions. Uh, if you do, please feel free to raise your hand in the queue for Pat on any uh, parks or buildings issues, uh, was relative to Water Shops Pond uh, and how the uh, project mm -hmm. is going or when folks can expect it to be refilled. Yeah, so I'll double check with Pete Garvey, but sometime in May. So I'll follow up with Pete Garvey tomorrow to just, to, but I haven't heard that there's been any delays uh, with construction, but I, I will follow up and get back to you with, to make sure that's still the uh, final date for that. Great. Uh, Councilor Press. Oh, Councilor, you're muted there. I see you're mobile. Pat, hey, could you give me an update with the uh, Jefferson Park, please? Yeah, Calhoun Park is under a master study assigned the contract with the vendor. So our re goals with the part of the money is to do the handball courts over. Okay. Then 
um, make a little grant through the playground. Okay, so, and that will be for this but year? But the mayor had allocated CDBT funds to get the process. We had some private, uh, private, a lot of private money coming, but they never came to fruition. Right. So, so uh, the playground, is it planned to be for this so year? So we could try to so I have the ground a handball. Um, hang on a second there, Council Perez. Pat, I think you're the playground you're will be for the year. Pat, we're losing you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? We can hear yeah, you now, but yeah. we kind of lost you. We lost you early on. You were talking about upgrades to the, the handball court, uh, but we kind of lost you after that. So I'll, again, I'm on a Comcast system, so I'll have to call Comcast. Yeah, well, I'm hoping we can uh, bring some new options uh, beyond for, that. Too, but. <laughs> for uh, Calhoun Park, CDBG funds that the mayor allocated after the private funds did not come forward as promised. And so that will give us money for the design and to restore the, uh, the handball courts there. So we actually are going to be having a meeting with the New York Council and the handball court people to discuss the placement and final design. The playground and the splash pad will probably be part of a state or a federal grant for those grant guidelines to come out and then we'll decide what grant that would fit because that's probably a half a million dollars to do that playground and that splash pad over. So the, so the answer is no, it's not gonna be for this year then. Because uh, the, the, the constituents have been asked. Uh, handball court done this year because that's in the most need the playground and the splash pad are both still functional and as you know we put the new back in last year so we're we're chipping away at it as we get funding okay so could you see see me for that meeting please thank you oh absolutely okay thank you Thank you, Councilor Perez. Councilor Govan. Um, I just want to uh, thank Pat for all the work that you guys have done out in Indian Orchard, and I'm um, excited to see what's happening next. Um, do you know if there's anything uh, in the um, pipeline for Indian Orchard or even Ward 8? It's now it's not just Indian yeah. Orchard. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, the mayor has his eyes on the um, open space to the left of Kennedy School, he put some designs together for that. So we're working on that. Um, he's also trying to determine other, uh, a way to have access to more water resources. So I've been, we just had a meeting on Tuesday on that. Um, so we're working on those issues. So um, and we do have a grant for um, Neal Park, that the old plastic park. So we're Hopefully we'll hear by late summer on the success of that grant application. So that'll be really a win-win to get that uh, back online uh, for not only Indian Orchard community, but for the entire city. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Pat. You guys have been really diligent. No, you know, we're, anything no. you and, and then I think we're putting in, uh, We Laura and Pete and I met on CPA and Chris Seabrooks and we um, now we feel we can put in for the Eagle because it, we found oh, some good. language. Oh, so we, we want to, we want, we're working we to get support to uh, put a CPA application for the Eagle for that monument. Excellent. And I Excellent. think too, I don't think we had enough. And I don't think we had enough for the irrigation system with the last grant for our Godfrey Triangle. So we would like to mm -hmm. include that too. Oh, that'd be great. So I know that the veteran uh, on our mind. So, so no, we have all right. not forgotten the orchard at all. All right, good. The veterans and will we'll be talk. Next. I'll let them know. Yeah. Thank so you. Let, yeah, we're going to need support letters if you could start that process for us. What did you need? Well, support letters uh, for the to put the oh, eagle because the TPC support letters. Absolutely, you've got we'll, it. We'll call, Thank we'll you. Call you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Govan. Uh, Pat, one thing you didn't talk about uh, yet that I, I, I know many people are looking forward to is the uh, skate park, non-motorized wheel park. It's, it seems uh, like the design and selection is coming along really well. Yeah. Can you speak briefly to that and the timeline we're looking at going forward? Yeah, 
Yeah, I would be happy to. So, uh, as you know, uh, Bike Walk Springfield has been a tremendous advocate for this uh, um, park to go somewhere in the city. We got a CPA application again to conduct that study. And um, out of that study, it was determined that the land to the left of the Boys and Girl Club on Crew Street was really the best fit. And what was exciting about that whole process, we had existing park land behind Boland School. Um, and there's a cut through between uh, that park land and behind the Nye Street Elementary School. So now all of that will be eventually connected into one park. So we applied for the grant. It's gonna to have to be, again, a phased approach. So the first phase will be for the bike park, um, the playground and the splash pad for that location. But it, it is the hope. So um, at our, maybe at the next meeting, we can, you can throw that. I'd love to share the conceptual um, design with the um, city councilors of, of the maintenance and development committee on that. So when we, I come in next week for MSBA, if you wanted to put that, on the list to discuss, I'd love to show it to you. Yeah, and we can put something together for you. So we put in for the application, that's a land and water grant. So again, we'll probably, we won't hear till the fall if, if it's successful or not, but we feel it will be. And we should, it's federal money administered by the state. So they usually sign off by the end of May. So um, hopefully we'll have some good news by the end of May that we're through that first hurdle and then we'll get good news in the fall. That's excellent. I mean, I recall that that very first meeting, um, it was probably in your office, probably three years ago, uh, maybe a little more. And, you, you know, you guys have really run with it. And it's been an incredible community effort seeing, uh, you know, not uh, walk, bike and Betsy certainly here, but also uh, a lot of the young people that have been involved in it uh, and others as well. So that's that's great to see it coming to fruition. Yeah. And I and I think you'll recall, I think the two sites, they they were kind of zeroing in on the land under 291. And then you and I had discussed about using that boys and girls club property. So it's kind of interesting that the study all came back to that first meeting we had that of, of that original site as being really one of the best in the city for this type of activity. Yeah, and, I mean, and, Park uh, definitely came to the table on it um, with an open mind. And I, I know Yolanda can't sell as well. I'm uh, just tireless on it. So uh, I think Yolanda was at that very first meeting. She was she she convened yeah. that very first meeting with us. So. Uh, yeah, and the boys and, and then the council should know the boys and girl club were equally very supportive. Right. Um, actually, Peter Pignelli Jr. kind of led the charge at the end to um, get uh, full support of, of their board for this to go uh, out there. So what they're going to do is transfer that land back to the city. Um, that's part of the grant requirement. It would become park land. So it was on that 99 year lease or something like that. Right. So we had yeah. technically it was parkland originally, but now it'll have to revert back fully owned by the city right. and they're, they're on board with all that. So okay. every, yeah, everyone you know, a neighbor and it's going to be neat. But I, I like that full concept plan where it, there's there's probably two more phases that can happen that would really be a tremendous asset for the community, the two schools that are the area and the Boys and Girls Club, because I could see kids being able now leaving Nye Street Elementary and, and Boland School, being able to walk through this new parkland and getting over to the boys club for after school program. So I think it's really exciting. The that potential. is great. Uh, I, uh, I, I posted the plans to the chat. Thank you, Betsy. Oh, I, I, just, great. I, I wanna go to, um, I wanna go to Council Hurst. He, he just has his hand up, uh, Council Hurst. Uh, thank you, Pat. Can you speak to Acorn Street Park, sir? And whether there's Acorn any Street on Park, that. yeah, we do. We're going to, we've got that design done. Um, we are working with the um, girls club, which is adjacent to that. And I'm hoping once the frost, we're going to remove that fencing and that existing material. So um, I've been able to put the monies together to make some, get rid of that debris if you that's what it, it's kind of left to and then we have it on our radar watching for grants that might come up that will fit that that land okay keep us posted i will thank you councilor right. thank you councilor hurst all right so i think we've covered covered some good pieces with uh with parks and buildings we'll have um 
we'll have uh, the MSBA meeting next week specifically on, on the school project. So we'll get some more details there, but do any counselors have additional questions for Pat on uh, anything departmental related before we move to the conversation on rooftop solar? No? All right, perfect. Um, so I did, uh, Pat, I'm glad you're here. And we, we did also invite um, our budget director, Melanie Acobi, who does a lot of the uh, grant research and coordination out of the finance uh, office uh, to, for this portion of the conversation. So uh, what I wanted to kind of get just initial, initial conversation started around was uh, the status of rooftop solar for uh, both Lincoln Brightwood and in the future, DeBerry Swan. Uh, I know that we have uh, rooftop solar on Brookings Elementary as a result of the uh, NRDC grant, uh, but our climate action plan certainly calls for us to do more rooftop solar. And mm -hmm. we've been told so far in the design processes for both buildings that they are solar ready, uh, but there just hasn't been funding secured for uh, solar to actually be installed. So, so uh, Pat, maybe we'll start with you on the logistical side. Yep. Um, have you had any conversations about moving forward with rooftop solar installation? And is yep. there any other rooftop solar other than Brookings that on our municipal fleet? There's, uh, we have a very small uh, solar on the, um, the fire station out in the orchard. Uh, we, it's for a solar hot water. Um, and that was through a grant that we got. So, and that's what it comes down to right now. Solar is still very expensive for the install. We haven't found, um, uh, an efficient way to get the panels. The only reason why we've got it going on Brookings, it's it's part of that NRDC grant, and that's what's funding it. And it's it's right. it's, it's it's not cheap. So what we have been doing to um, improve, we we have been buying, uh, uh, working with companies on the solar credit. So right now we're offsetting our current utilities with over one hundred and six thousand um, dollars in MMBTUs which relates to about $182,000 in our annual um, utility bill uh, by buying into these uh, solar fields that go up across the Commonwealth. So we're, we're trying to do our part, reducing our carbon footprint and assisting with the, um, with the solar credits that, that do exist. So the other concern that I have with solar is, is first the cost. Um, we do make it part of our new building, working with the Department of Capital Asset, they do a, a great job to make sure that these buildings, when it does become affordable again, it's going to be, they will be ready to go. But the other concern that, that I'm now reading is that a lot of these units are getting 10, 12 years old. Some of them are failing. And there's basically out now a waste of them. And how do you, you properly dispose of it? So when I think we've got to make that part of the conversation as we go forward, um, when we do finally get to that day when it is going to be cost effective to install solar. Um, what will it look like in 20 years uh, for the dismantling and the proper disposition of that property for when you have to replace it because they, they don't last in, indefinitely. There, there will be a timeline and, and it seems like after 10 years, your cost saving dramatically starts decreasing. So hopefully that technology will address that issue. But we are in the process of conducting both municipal and school buildings uh, on updated energy review of all our buildings. Solar is gonna be part of that review. And so I'm hopeful by maybe late August, early September, I'll be, maybe I'll have some answers to that very question is how we can uh, affordably get solar our building. So we went out to bid with the Brookings and I think Melody can tell you, it was, we're, we're like really just right there. We actually had to reduce the amount of solar panels we're putting out in the project just due to the cost. So, um, but the good news, it is going in and um, it, it's a start, um, but it's um, just, it's really cost driven at this point. Yeah, I appreciate that perspective, and and you've definitely done a great job uh, on the city side with the procurement, the energy procurement. So I'm very supportive of uh, the uh, supporting the solar credits and and, and purchasing the uh, energy credits as as part of our municipal uh, energy bulk purchasing. Uh, so that's great. I, I would like to see us have more physical infrastructure on the buildings, and I appreciate the the conversation around. Uh, down the line, the uh, eventual uh, disposal. But I think that's a conversation the industry is having you know, as, a, as a bigger picture. And I agree the technology will advance uh, to address it. 
Uh, so I'm glad to hear about the audits uh, or the uh, updated energy reviews. So will that include a feasibility of rooftop solar on each building that you do a review for? Yeah, I, I'm going to be uh, working with uh, the entity to um, to get that that dollar and cents figure, so we could all start making that intelligent decision of does it make sense or is there a, is there grants out there and so forth that would uh, pay for, pay that for that. That kind of leads to Melanie on, um, have you had a chance, Melanie, to take a look at what is available state and federal so far and maybe anticipated down the line if we ever see our friends down in DC get it together on the uh, Build Back Better initiative? Yeah, so I unfortunately haven't had much time to dig deep into it. What I have looked for uh, it often has a lot of rebates or grant options for personal homes. It's a little bit different when it comes to public properties. Um, so oftentimes I've noticed uh, like what Pat was seeing with the NDRC grant, if there's like a, a grant theme of the year where they're you know focusing specifically on climate change. If we tie in those elements with a greater project, that's usually the time when we take advantage of those. But as of now, I have not seen uh, a large one that's available at the moment, but who soon say that it's not going to come up in the future? Yeah, it might, it might be worth, I, I have a meeting with some of our uh, legislative delegation next week, and I'm going to bring this up to them as well about, you know, the need for the state to really come in with kind of free and clear grant funding for gateway cities like Springfield to be able to build this infrastructure. And I, I you know, I think the, the infrastructure funds that are coming that have already been passed in DC, there may be some opportunity there as well. That's all going to be distributed through the state. Um, so I, I think we may need to get with our state legislators. It'll be helpful to have the numbers, Pat, that you're putting together. Um, do you think you could provide uh, just some estimate now, maybe just using what you have from Brookings even for me to be able to go out and say, you know, like, here's the average cost that we're encountering on trying to establish I, that type of infrastructure. I, I, the construction industry and steel, everything has just gone so crazy in the last six months. I really don't. So that's why I want to wait for that audit. And then just to let you know, we, Putnam was built to accept solar too. So that's another school okay. building that could accept. So, yeah. So, as soon as I get it, I, I will be sharing that with the council just to make everyone aware. I, you know, I'd love to see it on the buildings too. So, yeah, I think I think we just need to set a goal. You know, we need to set a long term yeah. goal and then make that goal clear yeah. to to the folks that can bring the money. Yeah, yeah no, we're building the infrastructure so we can accept it. We just got to get it. It's like you said, the state's got to come up or the feds got to come up with a way to help cities and towns just install it. Yeah. Well, send me send me the pricing on Brookings as it stands. I know it'll be a little inflated because of the supply chain issues right now, but I, I just like to see it yep. uh, uh, relative to uh, what's happening right. right now. Sounds good. All right, so uh, let's revisit on this. Um, I'll, I'll chat with the legislative delegation, um, and we'll try to try to get together to set some sort of actual. I'd like to set a, a, a reachable goal uh, yep. once we have some more hardcore numbers. Sounds great. Uh, counselors, any other questions um, uh, or comments on rooftop solar? Yes, I have one, uh, Councilor Letterman. Yes, um, could I, could I have um, Melanie send me about the household? I think we need to start um, involving the community or whatever they have out there for information. Um, please, um, it's new news to me, so I want to filter it out to the community as well. Thank you. Sure, I'd be happy to send you. I think it was just like mostly options at uh, companies like Massey's or other companies that have like rebate options for people that want to do it and maybe some great opportunities, but I can send you what I was able to find. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Councillor Govan. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Letterman. Um, so I wanted to um, ask Pat, I think that is a very good point regarding the, and maybe Miss uh, Betsy would know more about this, but disposing of the solar panels when you have to, right? Because I actually just got solar on my house and I didn't think about, you know, when they have to be replaced, what needs to happen. So I'm wondering if there's something, we did a little bit more research on what, what will happen then because our carbon footprint isn't going to mean anything if, we're going to, in 10 years, we're going to be creating all this um, additional waste. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. We're, we're, we're going to include that with our information as we make recommendations to the council. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And I do see uh, Betsy, you're with us and you have your hand up. Uh, so go ahead. We, we appreciate you taking the Well, time. I just wanted to bring up uh, an issue that uh, downtown Springfield has. Um, and since there are a number of municipal buildings in downtown Springfield, you need to be aware that Springfield, like a number of the other older gateway cities, have what are called area networks uh, in terms, rather than a distributive network in terms of um, different lines going to different transformers. Ours are a whole area network and Eversource um, and the state have very restrictive requirements related to how much solar can be put back onto the system um, in areas with an um, area network. So like I looked at over a two year period, tried to see about putting solar on my house and found I could not because of this area network issue. So it's one of the things that I think uh, has to be keep being brought up to Eversource and looking at ways that they can better address this issue, because you may find that to be an additional barrier to putting solar on some of these downtown buildings. Um, and in terms of now, two years ago, Springfield, together with Longmeadow, was um, um, selected to be a solar participate in the Solarized Massachusetts program. And unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, the city administration was not in a position at that time to get behind this program that they submitted this grant for and we were selected. So almost all we, um, this program basically offered homeowners in Springfield a tremendous opportunity to actually own their own solar versus what the Vivavent and Trinity are ripping off people with. And unfortunately, people had been hearing so much from those companies that we got very little interest in Springfield and Longmeadow mostly did all the installations. Um, and these were with, these would have been at no cost to people. So it, it would be worth really seeing if the, we could get the sit at, maybe as a result of Pat's audit and stuff, we could really get the city on board to re, to, to have us do a solarized mass program again. And that really would provide tremendous, it, 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 you bid, you basically get a company to come in and give a below cost installation program. You loan, you, you have them helping people know how to actually own their equipment and not be ripped off by the uh, companies who are only leasing and, uh, but we needed help from the city to help explain, to actually promote that to people. So that's something down the road, I would hope Springfield might do again yeah. and do it Thanks. right this time. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with Solarize. I mean, that's definitely more on the residential side. And, and there were, yeah. I think there were a few challenges um, that existed there, not, not only with the need for uh, marketing and outreach, but also just the what it did require of residents, I think was a bit daunting. And certainly the um, I think the uh, I think you're right too that the market, unfortunately, had people uncomfortable because of some right. of the companies that have been out there. So it I'd like wasn't to actually that daunting to people. But anyway, I, it, I'd like yeah. to address I'd like to address residential yeah. at a different time, a different uh, time. Right. But I think just I, but I think with right the municipal now, buildings know that there is this since a member of them are in this downtown core, you may run into additional issues there. So and it's good to, and, it, and, and the utilities aren't upfront about that. Right. That's why, uh -huh. that's why they strung me along for two years. Yes. Uh -huh. And we, we can, I, I know there's some other conversations about that happening too at the state level about uh, how much of those, how much of those policies are rooted in uh, actual technical issues and how much are rooted in uh, other issues for, for like right long. exactly so, exactly so, we'll, so we'll when, you're, when you're that. talking at the state level I think and it's something that it's a gateway cities Fitchburg has the same issues Pittsfield has the same is issues right exactly yeah yeah 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Betsy. Um, so yeah. So let's let's stay let's stay connected on on the uh, municipal rooftop solar piece. We'll look forward to Pat's uh, audits and uh, and I'll 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 link back Melanie with you and um, TJ on uh, conversations with the state delegation. Uh, any other questions, uh, counselors, uh, relative to that issue, or should we move towards adjournment? All right. Motion. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All right, motion made by Councilor Perez, uh, seconded by Councilor Govan. But before we go, I do just want to thank everybody for uh, for coming out for this meeting. I know we have a number of maintenance and development committee meetings planned uh, in the upcoming month and uh, sustainability environment committee meetings as well. Uh, so we got a lot of issues before us and a lot of work uh, in the year ahead, but especially uh, Patrick and uh, Melanie for taking some time uh, after five o'clock. I do appreciate it. Uh, and I hope that you guys have a great rest of your evening. No, we appreciate thank you. all the support. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having us. Thank, thank you, guys. Betsy, thank, thanks thank for you, Melanie. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.